Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, welcome to this Sebastian City Council meeting. Um, if you would all rise for the invocation, which will be read by the Reverend Wayne Rogers. Uh, but before Mr. Rogers starts, if we could have a moment of silence for the uh, all families affected by the tragedy in Parkland, Florida today. Thank you. Let us pray. Most heavenly and gracious Father, we praise you as we gather in your presence to be your humble servants as we serve our fellow man. We ask your guidance, strength, and wisdom and for the true spirit of cooperation, honesty, integrity, and justice as the services of the City of Sebastian are carried out. Specifically, bless your trusted servants, the mayor, the council members, city manager, city clerk, and the city council, and all our employees. Bless especially, protect and defend our police force, our fire department, and all law enforcement throughout the nation. All those serving in our armed forces, home and abroad, that our leaders in Washington find common ground in carrying out the will of us, your people. We ask this and for the many unspoken requests in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 You remain standing for the Pledge of Allegiance. That will be led by Councilmember McParland. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States, States, States of America, America and, and to, to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. A roll call, please. Mayor Hill. Here. Vice Mayor Kitchen. Here. Councilmember Dodd. Here. Councilmember Iovino. Here. Councilmember McPartland. Here. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, leads us to item five, agenda modifications. Council, do you have any agenda modifications you'd like to make? Uh, speaking to the city attorney earlier, he had something he'd like to bring up. Yes, Mr. Mayor, Honorable Council. Um, I uh, would ask if, uh, if possible, if you could table uh, under public hearings, item 11A, the second reading on the medical marijuana. Um, I know this has been a long time in coming. However, having just been on a little over a week and I've had a lot of, of stuff thrown at me as far as uh, uh, getting indoctrinated here and I have not had uh, time to look at it uh, thoroughly and it is a significant piece of legislation for the city and I would appreciate some more time to look at it before we go forward with the second reading. Would you be ready to read that at the next council meeting? We, we should be good to go on the second. If we pull uh, this, the next meeting. I guess if, if we pull this, is there going to be an issue with it being on second reading or should it be tabled? Tabled? Yes, we can table it to the, to the, to the next meeting. And if, if there any adjustments need to be made, I'll bring it forth then. Okay, I guess we would have, we would, the only difference would be we'd have to re-advertise uh, and stuff like that, if I'm not mistaken. If we table it to the date and time certain, we should be okay, correct? Yeah. I, I, I move we table item uh, 11A until the February 28th meeting. Second. All right, is there any objection from city council members? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, same sign. All right, thank you, council. All right. So for the public's uh, knowledge, the city attorney had asked that we table the, the, the item 11A, which is the second reading on the marijuana ordinance, uh, so he could have a better look at it. Any other modifications? All right, thank you. Leads us up to proclamations, awards, and brief announcements. You see these big boxes sitting next to my head. They actually didn't do a good job of blocking my face from the television like they were supposed to. Um, Actually, we have a presentation by Nigel, Nigel Hargraves from the Sebastian Inlet Sail and Power Squadron of these wonderful defibrillators, I think. AEDs. <laughs> Good 
Mr Mayor, I am just going to say a few words, if you don't mind. Sure. Mr Mayor, City Council members and representatives of the City of Sebastian, in 2002, I first came before this, the then City Council to address them on prospective chartering of Sebastian Inlet Sail and Power Squadron, one of then over 400 plus squadrons throughout the United States, whose goal is to promote safety through education of the recreational boater. I had previously previously been a member, then commander, of Vera Beach Power Squadron, but realised, with others, that there was a demand for our services here in Sebastian, as the type of recreational boats and boaters are different than, here in, than there in Vero. Working closely with the then City man Manager, Terence Moore, who was 100 per cent behind us, the City graciously allowed us to use the Sebastian Yacht Club as our base. This building was ideal for us, being adjacent to the public boat ramp. As we all know, in September 2004, Hurricanes Francis and Jean devastated our area, including Sebastian the Yacht Club. Coming back to the Council, we were given permission to use the community centre for our classes. Finally, after this City Hall was completed, the Council allowed us to use the former Council Chambers and the refurbished Yacht Club and this has continued to the present day. We are a growing squadron, always looking for boaters, wishing to learn more about boating safety for themselves, remembering that passengers on board a boat is the skipper's responsibility, and learning awareness that other recreational boaters may not have your skills. Apart from boater education side of our organisation, we continue to work within the community. Over the years, we have adopted three of Spoil Islands, which we regularly clean up and restore. We currently have a program growing mangroves from cuttings at members' homes, and then, when of sufficient size, these are transported and planted around the Spoil Islands. The purpose of the mangroves is to stop the erosion of sand from wind and wave action. Over the past few years, we have also had Thanksgiving food drives, given toys and bikes for less fortunate children at Christmas, donated self-inflating comfortable PFDs for boaters, and other projects of a smaller scale. After speaking with the city manager in December, the squadron held a fundraiser in January. The purpose of the fundraiser was to give something back to the city for the 15 plus years you have allowed us to use your municipal buildings. The goal was to raise sufficient funds to purchase an AED, a heart defibrillator, to donate to the city, to be placed in publicly accessed municipal buildings so that all organisations could, if necessary, give immediate response to someone suffering a potential heart attack while awaiting the arrival of a paramedic. I am delighted to say that working with a manufacturer called Heartsmart.com, today we are able to donate to the city not one, but two AEDs. We hope to minimise accidents on the water but with these wall-mounted AEDs, hopefully we can save a life on shore as well. This is our way of showing our appreciation to the City of Sebastian for their past and, hopefully, their future support. I would ask the members of our Sebastian Squadron to stand and be recognised for your hard work. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Can you hear this? All right, thank you guys so much for everything you've done over the last 15 years. Uh, you guys have been a, a great addition to the Sebastian. We appreciate everything you've done. And thank you so much, and the people whose lives are saved by these devices will be thanking you in the future, I hope. Thank, thank you. If, if, I could take, if I could take just a moment more, Mr. Mayor. Uh, yes, throughout my association with the city of Sebastian, I've worked with three city managers, the aforementioned Terence Moore, Al Minna, and currently Joe Griffin, as well as numerous city councillors. There is, though, one person with whom I have dealt with consistently. This person works behind the scenes and, as with any business or organisation, is the go-to person 
whenever I needed something or didn't know to whom I should be speaking. I always get pointed in the right direction. This person is professional, courteous, knowledgeable, and immaculately turned out as befits the position they hold. I would hope this person is held in the highest esteem by every elected and employed official. I am, of course, referring to the city manager's right-hand man, or in this case, woman. I would like to go on record in recognising the immense asset to the city of Sebastian the city, uh, has in Jean Tarbell. Thank you. Well, I can't say that the view got any better for you guys, but it did for me, so now I can see you all. <laughs> uh, are there any brief announcements this yes, evening? Yes, Mr. Mayor. Um, February 17th, the Art Club is having a show at Riverview Park from 10 to 4. February 19th, which is a Monday, City Hall will be closed for President's Day. February 23rd, there is a Chamber of Commerce concert in the park from 5.30 to 8 called Shark Bait uh, Playing. And February 24th, the Sebastian Police Department is doing movie night out for your families at 6 p.m. And the movie on deck is Zootopia. It's a Disney film. So please come out and support. Thank you. I do know Zootopia. <laughs> that, I've seen that several times. It's a pretty darn good movie. And the last time we, uh, I believe it was the last time the, the police had the movie in the park, it was uh, Polar, Express. Polar Express. And what a great, amazing evening. And, and I very much appreciate the, uh, the, the police department for taking care of that. Any other announcements? All right, hearing none, that'll move us to item seven. At this time, I'll recess the regular city council meeting and open a quasi-judicial hearing. Uh, looking for a motion on item 7B, approval of the minutes for the uh, Board of Adjustments. I'm so moved. All Second. right, thank you. And I'll now open the hearing on the quasi-judicial quasi meeting for Harris residents shed setback. Mr. Attorney. Uh, variance requested from section 54-2.7.5B1 of the Sebastian Land Development Code to permit accessory structures to be located within a required yard setback and from section 54-2-5.2.2D5 to permit accessory structures to be three feet from the side property line, whereas the code requires such structure to be 15 feet from the side property line for the RS-20 zoning district. All right, thank you very much. Uh, Council, do you have any ex parte communication? All right, um, I have received several letters that are uh, uh, all in opposition to uh, the variance, so I'd like to make sure those get put in public record. Okay, thank you. Madam Clerk, will you swear in those who will be presenting those who will be offering testimony, if you'll stand and raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm that the factual statements and factual representation which you are about to give or present during this public hearing will be truthful and accurate? I do. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Uh, this evening we're gonna be discussing a variance on a property in South Moon Under, and it is now time for the applicant to make a presentation. Is the applicant here? Yes. Yes, sir. I purchased, uh, I'm Bob Harris. I own the property at 755 South Fisher Circle. I've purchased the property out of foreclosure uh, about two years ago, and it had been vacant for almost a decade. 
Uh, it was regional, uh, the uh, Hank Fisher House, who done a lot of property developments here in uh, Sebastian. And I'm a fairly new resident of Sebastian, and I've taken this house from an absolute eyesore to something that was once the jewel of the neighborhood. I don't know if I could obtain what he did, but uh, I'm doing my absolute best. And in these sheds are the, the equipment. I've got a couple lawn tractors and things like that, uh, a chipper shredder, a large chipper shredder, um, various garden tools, other miscellaneous things that I don't want to store in the garage that are gas powered and gasoline engines leak and stink and it's better to be in sheds. Um, I purchased a shed from Home Depot that was a wood shed and it was a, a 10 by 12 shed. I was told that I need to get permits for it. I got permits for that um, and I asked about these little plastic sheds. Well, initially it was, um, well, we really don't care about little plastic sheds. And I, th I think that was probably correct as far as what I can see and from what I've been told from Home Depot. So I, I got in a couple of these plastic sheds and I ended up getting a couple more. Um, then there was some issue with the uh, Homeowners Association coming down to uh, City Hall and um, stirring up a little, little bit of a ruckus. So um, they asked me to get permits for these sheds. So the, uh, initially they, they didn't quite know how to permit them. So they, they asked me to get um, uh, an engineering drawing of the sheds and have them strapped. So I, I did that and the engineer, I, although I went through quite a few of them, I found somebody that could do these little engineering drawings of my, my little buildings. And um, I presented this to the um, building department and uh, received a, uh, I don't think it was receiving a permit yet, but I got the application for the permit. Um, they came out and inspected. They said the sheds were too close to the property line. And behind my property, or not, it, alongside my property, there's a 30 foot canal. And on the other side of the canal, there's another 30 to 50 feet of a bank that goes up to a row of oak trees that separates my property from the neighbor's property. The neighbor's property is vacant. Um, there's, uh, so there's not 10 feet or 15 feet, there's 30 feet plus another 30 to 50 feet. So we're talking anywhere from 60 to 80 feet behind my sheds to the neighbor's property, any buildable area of the neighbor's property. And the whole idea of a setback is to keep my stuff off of the neighbor's property so you don't build unsightly things along a fence line. You know, it's basically separation is the idea. Um, although the backside of my plastic sheds is no different than a fence, and I was originally gonna put in a fence because it's an eight foot vertical drop into the canal below and where my daughter plays and she has friends come over, I didn't want anybody falling off, but when I investigated the fence contractors, they said because they have to anchor the fence to the backside of the wall it, for a 150 foot section, they wanted $4,000. So these sheds were $500 a piece. Not only did they provide me with storage, but they also provided a safety barrier. Um, and at the time, I was told by a number of people um, that it, we don't need permits for little plastic sheds, so they don't, if they don't need to be permitted, they don't need to have any setbacks, and plus you've got the canal behind you, it's not a big issue. Well, that, that seems to have changed and now has become, unfortunately, a, a rather large issue. So I, I wanted to show, you know, how do we make the technology work? Can I put, okay. I have a number of photos that I want to run through and maybe we can sort out what we're seeing here. Okay. Oh, okay. So this is, this is what my property looks like from the street. This is the light area down here is my driveway and then my house is set back up into the trees. This is, this part here is the edge of the road. The driveway snakes up and the house is back in the trees. A little closer view of what the house looks like. And the sheds are all the way off on the left side. Um, and I'll show a picture of that in a second. This is. I'm on a lake and this is a view of the back side of my house from the lake, from the other side of the lake. The lake is roughly 200 yards wide. Um, this was actually taken at a gazebo 
that juts out onto the lake. Um, you can make out the roof line. I have a, a galvanized roof, a metal roof on the house. You can make out the roof line of the house. And the sheds are actually back over in this area here. Um, so the neighbors across the lake, unless they really look hard or get out a pair of binoculars, they can't see anything. And the reason I put these sheds where I did, in addition to the, the making the barrier for this vertical wall, is that they're not visible to any neighbors unless you come over my house with an airplane or a, or a helicopter. Um, this is the South Moon under development around the lake. The border is this canal here. My property is the red dot. Um, there's three properties to the west of me and two properties to the east of me that are not developed. They're vacant land. Um, the equipment that I have in the shed I use to take care of these vacant properties and the, the road frontage that I'll show you here around South Fisher Circle. There is grass and shrubbery and I, I don't have any grass on my property. It's either natural foliage or chip bark. Um, so the, the equipment that I have in these sheds, I help take care of the neighborhood or at least around the vacant lots. So you can see the canal behind my house and the separation. This is, this is the canal. The sheds are right here. They're the, the little brown roofs. And the oak line, oak tree line that borders the neighbor's property is right here. And this is also a flag lot that comes out around here. There's actually two lots here. There's a front lot and a rear lot. So there's a, a long way from where these sheds are to any portion of that lot. And the actual buildable portion would be up here a long way away. And the, um, in one of the, uh, some of the paperwork that I received from um, the, uh, the city, it says, well, if, if the trees are all cut down, you look at the back of the sheds. Well, if the trees are all cut down, we not only look at the back of the sheds, but we look at the wall anyway. And then you'll also see that my garage doors are on this side. You'll be looking at my garage doors. So the back of plastic sheds or the front of my garage. I, I mean, if I had a beautiful oak tree line, I, I certainly wouldn't, between the properties, I certainly wouldn't come along with a chainsaw and cut all these mature oak trees down to be staring right at my neighbor's, the back of my neighbor's house or side of my neighbor's house. So. The, uh, a little closer view of the sheds. These, these are the sheds. This is a large parking area. And what was initially suggested by the building department is to move these sheds the 12 feet forward, which if I put them in the middle of the parking area, it would negate me from being able to turn around and get a car in the garage. Now these sheds are small. They're only six by six. I mean, you can go inside of them and stretch your arms out and touch each wall. They're basically big enough for like a long tractor, or maybe a pressure washer and a few other items in each shed. So you can see the long distance of the canal and then the row of oak trees between the properties. The, the other option that I, I looked at was to concrete an area down here um, towards the lake but that would have made these sheds visible to my neighbors. So I wanted these sheds innocuous so that nobody could see them except for me, and I succeeded in doing that. But there still seems to be some folks on the um, board of directors of my community that, um, they don't, although there's no rules or regs <coughs> in my community about sheds, um, it's not addressed in the, um, in the deed restrictions, but they have a problem that I have sheds. They said, well, we, don't, we shouldn't have multiple sheds in our community. I, so I've, I've said for two years, well, if that's the case, then just change the deed restrictions to say that you don't have multiple sheds. So, you know, can I put these in another area of my property? Well, that's what I will do if, if, the, if the city council denies my request for the variance, but I, won, I would like to keep that separation um, of that wall to keep my daughter or any of her friends from falling off and not have to spend $4,000 to put in a fence um, and then I would have to concrete an area and then the sheds would be exposed to all the neighbors that are on the lake. You know, most of these houses around here would be able to see the sheds. So where I have them now, you can't see them from the backside 
across the lake. You can't see them from the street. Um, even when code enforcement came up to write me the notice of violation, they said, well, we didn't even know you had them until you came all the way around, up your driveway, made the turn, and walked down by your garage, and then, oh, here are the sheds. Now, if you go on the neighbor's property, you can take a photograph of the back of the sheds if you work your way through the foliage and look at the back of the sheds. But I've placed them so that they're not visible. Um, I also wanted to point out that there, um, there are other buildings and sheds that are in my development that are close to, here is, a, here is another shed. This house is actually owned by one of the HOA board members. And this is, this is the property line. And the shed is right up. Actually, the trees that are growing behind the shed actually touch that. Now, he's got a, supposed to have a 25-foot setback. And it's obviously right on the property line. Um, on the, uh, the side setbacks are 15 feet. The rear setbacks are 25, which is, it, there's only two small developments in the entire city of Sebastian that has the 15 and 25. 98% of Sebastian, it's 10 and 10. Um, I'm not quite sure why my development is different, but that's the rule for that particular zoning for that subdivision. But this is obviously not 25 feet. There's another person that built a second house on his property. It's got a two car garage. I don't know how big the house is. It looks like it's 1,200 to 1,300 square feet maybe. And it's real close to the edge of the property line. Is it 10 feet away, 15 feet away? I don't know, but it's probably pretty close. But that's a, that's a house, not just a shed. Um, there's another property here that has, uh, I think there's a shed back in here and a whole bunch of debris and all sorts of other stuff piled up right on the, right on the property line. So as far as enforcing this, I think it's definitely the, the spirit of the law rather than the letter of the law that, uh, okay, my sheds are three feet from my property line. Vertical seawall going down into the canal. Doesn't obstruct anything. Um, there's no problem in access to this. It's not really a canal, it's just basically a drainage ditch for the lake is a retention pond. And the, when the lake fills up enough, it'll actually drain out. Normal rainfall, the water flows down the canal into the lake. And then there's another canal around the development where it drains out of. So there's no restriction to the access. Um, there was a note um, from the uh, uh, community uh, development that it would restrict access to uh, to cleaning this canal. Well, it's a, it's a vertical wall. It's a straight straight down wall. Um, I also want to show. Oh, here's some other pictures of one of the, the sheds I just showed you that was up against the up against the uh, the property line. This blue is the back of the shed, and it's right up against the trees. Here's another. So if we're going to go by, well, everybody's got to have a 25-foot setback. This, this particular shed that's obviously been here for a long time, nobody seems to mind. This is the front of the shed looking at the street. So you can not only see this from the one side of the street, but the road turns around, and you can see it from the back side. Um, <coughs> no. And then I got on Google Earth. And I said, well, all right, they're making a, a deal about my, my sheds being close to my property line. <clears throat> Let's take a look on other people's sheds, because I've seen a lot of sheds very, very close to the property lines. And I think if, if I'm going to be made to move sheds, there seems to be a lot of sheds. So this is an area, these pictures that I'm going to show you next is in this triangular area here, we have 512 and then US 1, and this is South Moon Under. So this is the adjacent neighborhood, that, and it's the um, South Wimbro is the road that borders this. So I'm just going to show you some photos of some of the uh, sheds and buildings that I've seen. Now this is an interesting one. This house is a brand new house on a lot that was just, um, just graded and cleared. And they built this large blue and white steel building right behind the house. When I looked up on the uh, counter assessors, it looks like this fence is right on the property line. And this large building, now this is, again, this is the 98% of Sebastian where it's 10 feet and 10 feet. Um, I would guess this garage door is probably maybe a nine foot door. 
and you can see the distance between the side Excuse of the sir, building. Sir, I mean, that's all conjecture. You're just, you're just guessing. I mean, I'll allow you to continue, but, but your guessing doesn't do us a whole lot of good. Okay. Um, I, I, understand, I understand. So when you say, I guess this garage is this, or I think this is that, or this tree is touching this building, we don't have property lines out there. Um, so I'm just, I'm just going to let you know that you know, your guessing doesn't do me any good. Okay. All right. So, so if you could move this portion along a little bit, I would appreciate it. Certainly. Thank you. Okay. Well, I mean, we can see that there's a road here. There's an easement here. And we have a building that's right up against the, basically that property line. Um, right behind that building is another building. And that one is also very close to that road easement. This is a picture of a shed I took where the foliage is right behind it. And that's another building right up against the property line. I've got some aerial photos, again, from Google Earth of buildings. You would guess that this would be the property line that's right up against it. And this is, again, all in that, that South Wimbro neighborhood that's adjacent to us. Here's another shed with the fence line. And this actually, the fence line, when I looked at this on the ground, the fence actually comes up to the side of the shed and the back of the shed is basically the fence. Here's another one. And another one. And there's another shed here right on the property line. Now again, I don't have exact dimensions, sir, but we can see that there's, I've got, 20 of them here, that we have buildings that are right on property lines. And this one, this one photo actually has four. This one's another one right on the fence. And another one right on the fence. This one has a corner on the fence. So, and I can go through, I've got another, you know, I don't want to belabor the point, mm -hmm. but I positioned my sheds so that they're not visible to the neighbors. I positioned them so that they would be a safety factor. Um, the equipment in them I used to take care of my community, my side of my community, and I do it so that the equipment in them is not in my garage. You know, they serve a, a multitude of purposes, <clears throat> and I would just request the, uh, the variance. I mean, I, I think I'm trying to do things right by my community and trying to do things right by the city. Um, I uh, permitted items that the city requested that I permit. And so I, I would hope that we can uh, have this variance. Okay. Thank you very much, sir. Mr. Mayor, if we could, if, um, we're going to need copies of all those pictures. Anything you saw, of needs to, a copy needs to go to the city clerk for the record. We have to keep the record complete. Okay. So. Yes, if, you, if you'd hand those over to uh, the city clerk, I'd appreciate that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chair. Actually, we're going to have questions later. But that packet that you um, are mm -hmm. submitting as evidence with the emails and what have you, can you just have him verify that that is a, an up-to-date Google Earth picture of his property so we know that we're not looking at something that's 10 years old versus this picture right here? We just mm -hmm. have him, can we just get him to verify on the record that this is an actual... Mm -hmm picture of his property and it's accurate I can do that would you, would you be able yeah, to do yes that, yes sir? okay well, we, all right so you're, you so you're indicating that that is an actual picture of your property from the air this was, yes this was to us. okay all right thank you very right. much thank you all right you can take a seat thank you very much I appreciate your presentation uh, staff summation mr. Griffin it says request for a, a variance for 12 feet. Uh, it comes from a couple of different sections of our code. Um, the accessory structure section in Article 7 uh, requires that no accessory structure shall be located in any required yard. And then the section from Article 5 uh, establishes that setback for a side yard of 15 feet. And that is the variance request for Mr. Harris. Um, we have noted that his property is one, approximately a little over one acre, but only 0.61 acres of that property is upland. Uh, 0.47 is, is submerged in the land. And unfortunately, it would be easier in our department if we could uh, always go by the spirit of the code, but we've got to go by um, what is actually in the code. And section 54 1. 
uh, 2.5 establishes the criteria that the council should uh, review and consider uh, in your um, decision on, on your variance. Um, staff has um, noted in our staff report how we feel if the applicant has met these nine criteria. And of course, we always ask our applicant to also respond to that nine criteria, uh, which you have in your packet on Mr. Harris on how he feels. And just to summarize uh, the different um, items that you should consider, the existence of special conditions or circumstances. Um, we do have, uh, even though Mr. Harris's property is along a 30-foot uh, uh, um, homeowners association owned canal, we do have other properties in Sebastian that are certainly abutting 50-foot right-of-ways and other drainage canals that have also had to meet the side yard setbacks or the setback requirements. Um, we feel the condition was created by the applicant. He, has, he placed the sheds without applying for any building permits, um, and he was aware of the 15-foot setback when he applied for the existing shed uh, in 2015. Uh, special privileges may be conferred because there are other property owners in Sebastian who have uh, met their side setbacks and other setbacks for their sheds. Um, I appreciate Mr. Harris giving us uh, those aerials, um, but it is hard from the Google Maps to uh, uh, specifically establish without a survey where those property lines are. And I can't promise that there aren't some sheds in Sebastian that don't have permits that may not be meeting setbacks, but the ones that do go through the building department and have permits, they certainly meet those setbacks and, and verified with the submittal of a survey. The, uh, there were some other properties in South Munana that were cited, and those residents in Cub did come in, uh, relocate their sheds, and applied for the permits. Um, we've, we understand regarding the uh, maybe possibly the safety issues, uh, but because there are other places on the property where these sheds can be relocated and some additional uh, safety barriers that could be used, uh, we, staff feels that there's not a, a concrete hardship uh, that exists. Um, Without the actually being on the property and knowing if possibly a variance for 10 feet or 8 feet uh, would possibly still allow the applicant to allow, uh, use his driveway, staff cannot verify that the minimum variance would be granted. Um, we, we do feel, too, with regarding the vacant lots, the five vacant lots that are around Mr. Harris's property. Yes, they are vacant now, and I can verify I did go down the road, and you cannot see those sheds. But at some point, those property owners uh, would like to, I'm sure, develop their properties. And as long as they meet the code requirements for the trees that are needed for the size of the lot, uh, some of those trees and existing barriers may come down, and those sheds are going to be very visible, uh, especially the, excuse me, the lot that's right across the canal from those sheds. Um, the last three, though, he does meet the, the uh, criteria. Um, they're, they're, uh, the conditions and um, safeguards would be imposed. Uh, certainly the structural um, compliance with the building code would be met. Um, we are requesting that if, the, if you do grant the variance, if it could be just for these sheds specifically and not for any future sheds, um, the, uh, the setback variance would not apply to those. Um, and also that... Uh, Technically, the board, with regarding to time limits, if you had reviewed the order and the recorded um, findings of facts and conclusions before the special magistrate, uh, depending on your decision, there, there may be time, time uh, limits that Mr. Harris would have to meet before a fine starts occurring on his property. Um, after reviewing the criteria, staff is recommending denial of this request. All right, thank you so much. We're gonna go ahead and uh, now's the time we're gonna ask questions. Uh, anyone from council have any questions? Mr. McFarland? No. Staff or the applicant? Vice Mayor? Um, yeah, I, I made a point of getting the um, transcripts from the code enforcement hearing, mm -hmm. and I was concerned about the uh, various different things that Mr. Harris was told by the building department, which would confuse anyone at this point. However, I also uh, am concerned about the fact that his deed restrictions require him to ask for placement of a shed in that development, and he has yet to do that to this day. So I'm just concerned about that. Um, I think that he could find another location for the sheds, um, either directly behind the one that he already has, the big one that he already has in place, or on the other side of his property. But uh, I'm willing to listen to uh, the public and see what they have to say in this matter. All right, thank you very much. Um, I have no questions of either the applicant or staff. Mr. Dodd? No. <clears throat> um, I have a question for the gentleman himself. How, how close is the closest home east of you of the canal? That looked like two, 300 feet. Mr. Harris, please come to the mic. I'm 
sorry, I didn't, I didn't understand the question. The, it looks like if I'm, if I'm reading the, the Google image correctly, that side where all your sheds are are on the east side of your home and then the canal is just east of that. Yes. The next home that's within sight that from what you were, the pictures that you were showing looks like it's east of that. It, it, how, do you know approximately how far that is footage wise, 100, 200 feet? It well, looks like it's the, pretty each far Each of those away. properties are roughly, I think they're around three quarters of an acre or an acre. Okay. Um, and the, the existing home is on the other side of that. So okay. probably the distance from the, my property line to that other house is probably 300 feet. So we're not talking an 80 by 125 lot, a standard no, lot. No, no, these are, these are on, uh, you know, mine's over an acre. Okay. Um, your lot's over an acre, that answers that. Do we have a copy of the HOA that's been submitted with any of this, the current HOA? The, the I don't think that's relevant. Okay. The, the deed restrictions? The yeah. deed restrictions, I well, don't believe, the, excuse me, sir. I don't believe the deed restrictions are relevant to us decide, determining a setback. Okay. That'll be for them to decide. Can I, can I answer the vice mayor on a... a Absolutely. Go ahead. Um, the reason I have not asked for permission for my HOA is mm -hmm. my HOA um, deed restrictions do not mention sheds. They cover things like guest houses, servants' quarters. They've got something called a tool house, um, which is actually a reference to like the, uh, the 1800s of a blacksmith shop or a wagon wheel maker shop. And I've lived in many HOAs, and I've been the president of an HOA in Delray Beach that had 450 homes. We had an entire page on sheds, and our deed restrictions are just a few pages. They cover basic items. They don't say anything about sheds or temporary structures. And these little six by six plastic sheds, or even the bigger one that I have that's 10 by 12 feet, it's not mentioned in the deed restrictions. And uh, that's completely different from what my HOA says, but I'm going by what I read. And because I've been on HOA boards and been living in HOAs, if it doesn't say that I need to get any permission to put in sheds, I didn't. Okay. And I, 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 I stand by that, that, that I didn't do anything wrong by the HOA. Thank you. Does anyone else have any questions? Yeah, I, 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 I do. I just want to clarify something I just heard. Uh, the lots are not the, the above water line lots are approximately a half acre. They're about an acre, and that includes, uh, I think in this particular lot's case, 0.46 acres, which is submerged. So the actual lots in South Moon Under run, run approximately a half acre above water, not an acre. So that does change some of those dynamics right. in that presentation. Well, it, it depends, yes, you're right. It depends yeah. on where the house is located. Like a lot of my right. property is a pie-shaped, all the homeowners around mm -hmm. the lake own a pie-shaped right. lot of right. the lake. Yes. So. All right, thank you, Mr. Harris. Thanks. Six feet. Any other questions at this time? All right, we'll, we'll have an opportunity later to, to deliberate uh, amongst ourselves and ask some more questions. Uh, at this time, I'll ask if there's anyone in favor of the request for the variance, would you please stand up and come to the mic now? In favor of? Well, one at a time, please. Good evening. Uh, my name is Robert Devine. Uh, I live in the neighborhood from approximately 1989 on a part-time basis, now on a full-time basis. I am quite familiar with the house that Mr. Harris is referring to. It was derelict for approximately 10 years. It was stripped of all of its uh, contents of intrinsic value, the uh, pumping system, uh, all the copper, the aluminum. The house is basically a wreck, and some thought was given to demolishing it from the Homeowners Association. Mr. Harris took possession about two years ago, and has since turned it into a gem. There isn't a blade of grass, even though he doesn't have any grass on his property, but there isn't a brother. Euphemistically speaking, there isn't a blade of grass out of place. Now, his application is for a variance. And by definition, a variance is an application to part from an existing statute. As he has pointed out, no one will be prejudiced by this application. The adjoining landowner to his immediate east 
is two vacant lots. There's a 30-foot canal plus a buffer zone. To his east, there's two vacant lots. And as he said, it's a 300 feet. There are no deed restrictions. There's nothing in the deeds or in any of the uh, documents on record in the county clerk's office to the effect that the sheds are illegal or even mentions anything about sheds. This whole fight started with the board of directors. And I would assume that you're going to hear from someone who claims to represent the board of directors, but when in fact he does not. There has been no poll taken of the community. There's been no inquiry of the HOA membership. There has been no reference whatsoever as to whether or not the residents of this community are for or against it. The board of directors has taken upon itself to oppose it. Now, when you come into the city of Sebastian, you notice a sign that says the home of friendly people and six old grouches. Well, the six old grouches happen to be the six members of the board of directors of this HOA. <laughs> <laughs> Their rationale for doing this, now before I proceed, let me tell you something else. By profession, I am a civil trial lawyer with 55 years experience. Um, if I told you so, who some of my clients are, you would recognize the names. Uh, I, have, I have since retired. I have admitted to all of the federal courts on a national level and all of the state courts of my home jurisdiction. The board of directors are acting on their own and harassing this individual. They are violating the state statutes on both a civil, excuse me, a civil and criminal level. I have recommended, and I strongly urge the people involved to proceed with this in court. I think that Mr. Harris has an excellent federal action against the board, both individually and collectively. There's absolutely no basis whatsoever for the board's actions against Mr. Harris. The fact that they object to the sheds and the fact that two of the board members happen to be politically connected to the town is nothing more than additional harassment on the part of the board against Mr. Harris. As I said so earlier- So you have about, about one minute left. Excuse me? You have about one minute left. I'm sorry? A little less than one minute left. I'm sorry. I wasn't aware there was a time restriction. Yes, there is. Five minutes. I'm sorry. It's quite all right. As I said earlier, the purpose of the variance is to depart from an existing statute. As I also said, no one will be opposed, or no one in the, in the homeowners association is opposed to this variance other than the six board members and the six grouches. The, the homeowners association has not been polled, they have not been inquired into, and I think that it would be in the best interest of everybody that the variance be granted as no one will be prejudiced, particularly the adjoining property owners, because if they were going to be prejudiced or felt they would be prejudiced, they thank would you, be sir. here tonight to oppose it. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, sir. Anyone else speak in favor? Hi, Council. Good evening. I guess you thought you were the only grouches. Uh, <laughs> apparently, there's some more in town. My name is Andrea Coy, and I live at 501 Palm Avenue, and I'm here to shed a little bit of light um, on, in favor of Mr. Harris's application because prior to leaving Council, he had called me um, prior to the magistrate's hearing and all of that, and we had some long discussions. Um, I have two concerns, and they both deal with the process and what the city caused Mr. Harris to go through. That's my issue, not lines and variances, but I think there is a good, a compelling reason to look favorably upon his case based on what the city made him do. 
Um, I, I, I think I heard the vice mayor say that she looked at the magistrate's hearing. Um, I, I showed up at that hearing. Had never been to a magistrate's hearing in all my years here. Uh, this was a really long one. It was 45 minutes to an hour event. It was a very long hearing and a lot transpired. A lot of information, a lot of we did this, we did that. Uh, Mr. Esseltine was here on behalf of the city. The code enforcement officer was here. Um, it was extraordinarily confusing. I had heard Mr. Harris's case prior to that, uh, his side of the story. So at the hearing, you get to hear both sides of the story. To keep this story short, I'm gonna just cite uh, two things that concern me. Number one. Our, the city of Sebastian, uh, the building department, has taken a, a very, very strong, hard stance on these popped together sheds. Other cities throughout the state of Florida have made some exceptions. For example, you can have a shed if it's uh, 100 and less than 150 square feet, not a problem. There, there are exceptions all over the state. Why does this bother me that we have such a hard line? And, and by the way, until prior to Mr. Harris's case at the magistrate, um, the answer from the city was, they're illegal. You can't have one. I was told that. You can't buy that. They're for sale right now at Home Depot. They sell them every day here in town and all over the state. Why are they for sale if we can't put them up here? That's question number one. And there's no sign down there saying, we'll sell this to you, but you can't put it up in the city. Oh, by the way, if you live in, if you live in Felsmere, you can probably get away with it. So we have a very hard line stance. Um, you can buy snap together buildings, playhouses for kids, bigger than those sheds, and they do not require permits. Mr. Esselstein stood before the magistrate and said that. They're playground equipment, that's different. I'm sorry folks, I don't see the difference. That blows away in a hurricane just as well as a pop together shed. So that's issue number one, is, is the hard line stance. And oh, by the way, that stance has changed now over time. You are allowed to have one if you get it engineered and anchored. Well, that's, okay, that's nice. And oh, by the way, Mr. Harris did that. He paid an engineering firm because the city told him that's what he had to do. And I believe he anchored them. Are they anchored? I have not yet because huh. they won't be removed. Okay, I'm sorry, okay, I'm sorry. He, he, he has not, but he paid an engineering firm with the designs to do that because he was told he had to. And using your own record, the magistrate's record on page 21 of 253. 30 seconds. Um, you can see the sequence of events. And he was told he needed this engineering plan and then after he went and got that and applied, then they, then they said, oh, by the way, no, you're in the wrong spot. You can't have them there. So we put this guy through an awful lot of pain. They knew where those buildings were. They were up when the code enforcement went there. If, that, Thank you. if he wasn't told Thank on you. the spot, <clears throat> You know, I think it's really unfair. And that's, that's my major issue, is, is the fairness. I don't think the city has been honest with him all along. Thank you, Ms. Boyd. Okay, oh, gotta thank, go. Thank you very much. Thank y'all. Yeah. Is there anyone else? You have no idea how many times I've wanted to do that. Just kidding. <laughs> is there anyone else from the public speak in favor? Yes, sir. Mr. Mayor, my name is Todd Croy. I live at 749 South Fisher. And I won't take five minutes. I, I won't, I'll be very brief here. Um, my property has been owned since 1994. We've seen what's transpired and actually the improvements Mr. Harris has made to the property. 
and is very appreciative in the way he takes care of the neighborhood or his property for our, our development. What I heard earlier is the lots are, a portion of the lake is a pie shape, so you own a portion of the lake. So his land to have the sheds is limited. If you do not grant this variance, then he's going to be forced to move the sheds to somewhere where they're visible because of the size of the land. He, he's already stated that he'd have to put a concrete pad and put the sheds where they're, in, they're visible. They're not visible now. And so I, for that reason, I request that you all grant the variance. All right. Thank, thank you, you, sir. Anyone else from the public wish to speak in favor of the variance? Yes, ma'am. Hi, my name is Susan Prudhome and I live at 754 South Fisher Circle. I happen to be the home that's closest to Bob's property. I'm directly across the street. We're on an S curve, so um, I cannot see his home from my front door, probably because my garage juts out, but if I even were to walk to the end of my driveway, I cannot see his home. I can see his driveway. Um, just to get back to a question that you had, I happen to have the plat plan, and Bob's property is 154, 174, sorry, one, it's, it's 254.45 <coughs> from the property line of the next closest house um, west of him. So 200, it, there's where we're about. Everything around Bob's house is vacant and wooded, um, my dog had a rat in my backyard today. Um, they've been trying to catch a raccoon next door to me. We have lots of wild animals, and by having all that unkempt land for so long, um, we had lots of issues. He has really cleaned up the area. It's, it, it, there's not too many yards. I think our subdivision's beautiful. His is one of the best. His is one of the best. And can't see the sheds. I think his sheds are located in the most efficient and the most practical place because they're right next to his garages where, you know, he, he can get the gas can to put in the lawnmower and so on and so forth. I would like to just, everybody else, I had lots more to say and they all said it already, so I agree with everybody so far. Um, I would just like to say that He's a real good neighbor, and uh, the people that are fighting against him haven't got to know him as the good neighbor. It's, it's really too bad. They are definitely selectively enforcing and harassing him. So I would like to see the variance go through. All right, thank you so much. Anyone else wish, wish to speak in favor of this variance? All right, thank you all. Seeing none, I'll now take uh, Anyone who wishes to speak in favor of, or in opposition to this request, again, your time limits are five minutes and it would be nice if we didn't have a lot of repeat, 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 uh, so we can uh, move through this. So anyone that would speak in opposition to the request? Yes, ma'am. Hi, my name is Sharon Bush. I live at 736 North Fisher Circle. Uh, we've been there for about a year, almost a year now. And one of the reasons that we bought into South Moon Under was that there were no trailers. You know, everything had to be visibly hidden or hidden behind fencing, uh, that sort of thing. I don't have a problem I have a problem with the technical term of shed versus tools, <laughs> okay? What's the big difference? But I do have a problem with the multiple sheds. Um, if, if we allow the variance of three feet from the property line, he's setting a precedence. If we allow the six sheds that he does have, he's setting a precedence. When you really, when you read the HOAs, you understand that they have to be approved by the group, 
by the by the committee, and they have to and they have to. From what I understood when I read the HOAs, you were allowed two that needed to be in conjunction with the appearance of your own home, and these plastic sheds aren't. And unfortunately, it's right. If someone move, if the man next door to him across the canal decides to develop his property and he has to cut down some of those oaks that are there, which I would do, um, you're going to be looking at his sheds, tool houses. If he were to take them down to one or two, I wouldn't have an issue with that, but I still would have an issue with the variance of three feet. And I don't see a problem with the city stepping up and saying other people need to take, take action on their own properties if their sheds are in the wrong place to, to not set the precedence for Mr. Harris. Okay. All right, thank you very much. Anyone else? Yes, sir. Kelly Mather, how do I get this to display up? Just lay it down on the. Uh... I just want to verify for you that since most of you weren't around when I was chairman of the Planning and Zoning Commission, okay, we addressed the 15 foot setback many times. We wouldn't allow people on the canal to do that. We shouldn't allow anybody to jeopardize our drainage from the lake by being that close. And basically, <clears throat> we've held the line when we were doing this planning and zoning group that would meet every other Thursday for about six years. And therefore, that's the standard. We should keep that standard. There's no need to go back. Thank you. All right, thank you. Anyone else who wishes to speak? In opposition, yes, sir. And if you're going to speak, uh, could you please be ready when the other person is done to go ahead and come forward? Thank you, Mr. Mayor, City Council members. Get this set. How does that go on? Oh, there it is. Okay, so this is out of out of your uh, your records there. I'm uh, going to keep it short. Name, oh, name I'm sorry, address, Wayne yes. Bachman. Thank you. Um, first, I'd like to say a few comments as acting president of South Moon Under Property Association. For the record, we were elected. Me, myself, the Grouches, and that this are, is our homeowners association bylaws and declarations, so we do have them. It's not relevant to this tonight, though. Right. Most of the board members are concerned that snap together plastic sheds may not hold up in high winds and or hurricanes, and the pieces of the sheds and or the contents therein could fall into the drainage ditch and block the culvert that goes under our road, causing undue flooding in our development. I can say on behalf of the Architectural Control Committee, we have made no decision on this issue because Mr. Harris has never submitted plans for us to approve. In my his past history, I can say that no owner has ever requested seven sheds and because there are two buildable lots to the west, we would probably not allow this. This is the affidavit, by the way, that, that Mr. Harris did say that he would abide by our rules that was notarized by him. Um, as a board member and speaking only by my, my personal behalf, I believe Mr. Harris has made his, his own interpretations of the codes and bylaws. In reviewing city codes in the bylaws, 
We both use the word structures. And Mr. Harris told the board a long time ago that plastic sheds do not fit into the category of structures. So I can only assume that based on that, Mr. Harris chose not to pull a permit either. On page 20 of your agenda, your officer gave him two citations, one for sheds, one for recreational vehicles on the property. You can see, clearly see on Google Maps, on your Google Maps exhibit, many boats were on that property. It is my understanding that Mr. Harris was cleaning, repairing, and reselling these boats. I assume that he did not consider these at the time as recreational vehicles and chose not to comply with your codes and our bylaws. Unfortunately, this over the past almost two years has certainly brought in a division in our nice community at South Moan Under. In closing, the board recommends the city council deny this variance. All right, thank you very much. Anyone else? All right, seeing none. Mr. Harris, uh, now's the time when you can uh, go ahead and respond to anything that you've heard. Thank you, sir. Um, it's, been, uh, it's been stated that I, I intentionally broke the rules of uh, the city of Sebastian. And I'm a retired police officer with 20 years of service in San Diego and Delray Beach. 10 years in each city. I don't break rules. I was not trying to break rules. When I went in and got the permit for the shed, the wood shed, I was told, we don't care about plastic sheds. You don't need a permit for your plastic sheds. The HOA complained, the city, uh, Dan Haney came out. Um, Andy, I don't remember what his last name, he also came out, looked at my plastic sheds. We don't care about plastic sheds. Andy actually walked by them when he signed off the inspection of my woodshed, and I'm like, are these okay? And he says, I didn't see no plastic sheds, making a joke about them. The code enforcement officer, Curtis Bloomfield, who couldn't quite remember these conversations when I went in front of the magistrate with him, um, said multiple times after he talked to Dan and Andy that the city really doesn't care about plastic sheds. Now, I'm sorry if I have six of them. They're a temporary measure until I'm trying to buy the property that's directly in front of me between me and the street. It basically borders my driveway of my flag lot, and that property is a half acre. I can combine it with my property and put up a nice four-car garage. It would be hidden back in the trees, permitted the whole nine yards, and, that would, and those sheds would come down and I would put up some sort of a fence. They've always been a temporary structure. And there's many cities that it actually states in the um, community affairs that the, they, and they use the term snap together sheds available at home center stores do not have to meet building codes. Now, um, Wayne said these sheds are illegal when I first started talking to him. And I said, they're not illegal. They're just not mentioned in the building code. He says, well, if they're not in the building code, then they're illegal. I said, no. If a playhouse or a play structure or a tree house or a little gazebo or a garden arbor, they're not in the building code. They're all structures. They're not illegal. These little sheds that are this big and this big, yeah, they look terrible lined up on that wall. It just, it, it, you know, even I don't, I don't like seeing that picture, but they're just little plastic sheds. Um, they don't fit the building code. And people talk about the, oh, well, the, the roof is gonna blow off and decapitate somebody. Well, if the roof blows off at 150 mile an hour storm, there's, I, I've been out in hurricanes. I was in Wilma as a police officer where the wind was blowing at 140 miles an hour. I saw roofs come off of office buildings and, and signs tumbling down the street. My little plastic sheds were a little piece of plastic weighs 10 pounds or 15 pounds. It, they're not gonna do any more damage. That's a moot point compared to the, the giant palm fronds and trees and signs and roof material that's blowing down the street. And if you're out in a 150 mile an hour wind, well, I guess you're gonna get what you're gonna get. But I didn't do anything that I felt was wrong. Uh, it's just the same thing with the HOA rules and regs. If they don't want sheds, they need to say sheds. If they say guest houses and servants' quarters, 
and not say sheds, that's fine. And it, so it doesn't have a quantity, it doesn't have an, uh, an idea of what a shed is. Also, I've always said that sheds are structures, but they're not buildings. That's why they don't meet the building codes. That's why they're not included. Um, the other interesting thing is uh, Kelly Mather was just up here. He was the older gentleman, and he's the one with the shed that is right up against the property line. No, sir, 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 take a seat. Thank you. So it's, it's very interesting that he has a shed that right. is right up against... Oh, we don't know, sir. Oh, I, I'm no. just going to let you know now. We don't know that that's on the property line. That's conjecture on your point. You don't have anything that shows that it is. So at this moment, I would, I would ask that you move on from that point. Okay, so, all right, well, I guess that's it. Well, all right, thank you. thank you very much, sir. Ms. Bosworth. I'm just going to reiterate that section 54 1.2.5 verifies that the Board of Adjustment must use the following criteria to approve or deny the variance. Um, the nine criteria that staff had reviewed, and based on our consideration of the criteria, staff recommends denial of the request. All right, thank you very much. Uh, Council, um, I, I think there's a lot of things that have been strewn about this room uh, this evening that are quite frankly irrelevant and I think that the squabble that the HOA is having with the homeowner is irrelevant. I think the photographs that show structures without property lines are irrelevant. I think the fact that they're plastic sheds quite frankly are irrelevant. I think what we have to decide is whether or not uh, we want this individual or any individual for that matter who come before us on an individual basis uh, to be granted a variance to allow those six sheds to be three feet from the property line. So I'll take some discussion on this, Mr. Avino. I'm gonna hold off on any comment right now. Okay, Mr. Dodd. I, I just have a couple of questions. Um, I, I want to reiterate, uh, I think it's been said at least once before that Homeowners Association um, rules and regulations are not part of our decision process. That's between the homeowner and the Homeowners Association. And that is a civil issue, not part of what we have to deal with. So I want to make sure everybody understands that. Uh, is that correct? That, that is correct. Okay. Yeah. Um, I knew it was. I just wanted to, I wanted to give you a chance to talk. <laughs> oh, okay, thank you. Sir. <laughs> okay. Uh, Dory, um, is there any specific uh, indication in the building code or in the land development code that prohibits the use of these quote unquote snap on snap together sheds? Uh, no, under our definition of structure or accessory structure, it does meet those. I know there are exemptions. I believe uh, Mr. Esseltine can verify this. There are exemptions in the Florida Building Code for playground equipment. Yes. Um, but these specific sheds, whether there's one or two or how small they are, meet the definition in both the Land Development Code and the Building Code as a structure, okay. which requires permits. And so they would be considered as an ancillary structure on that residential property then, just yes. like any other shed would be, right? Yes. And what's the square foot requirements on an ancillary structure for permitting? So uh, uh, the Land Development Code says that up to 5% of your property can have accessory structures. Um, it was brought to our attention today that the code does not state how many. We've always said that if you're allowed 1,000 square feet, if you have a double lot, you could have five 200 square foot sheds. We did verify with the existing shed and these sheds that he is under that requirement. He, he is in compliance with that. Okay, so his, the, the larger shed plus the six smaller sheds do fall under that requirement? Yes. Okay, so they are, um, in, in that case, they're authorized accessory structures. So the only issue to deal with is whether the 15 foot setback uh, is yes, that, that, that he's that asking the setback for is, requir is preventing us from issuing a bona fide or an approved permit. Right. Uh, usually your permits, your, you have your zoning review for your setbacks and then your structural review for your tie downs on sheds, which most of the prefab sheds usually come with those manufactured 
engineering specs for the tie downs. Um, that's why uh, similar to these plastic sheds and also those canvas awnings that you see, it's very hard to get the engineering for the wind load on that. They usually don't come with those, sh with those product uh, purchases from Home Depot. Okay. Um, Mr. Harris did hire a private uh, engineer to create the tie down engineering that he needed for the wind load um, and, and he, they have been approved by the uh, building department. It is just the setback, the zoning issue for the issuance of the permit. Okay, does an ancillary structure that is less than 100 square feet require permitting? Yes. Okay, so they, it does require permitting, all right. Uh, okay, I, I, from, from my perspective, the, the, the fact that they weren't permitted meant that no one had an opportunity to view that they were not within the appropriate setback. And so, uh, in, in under the code, what I just heard was that they are approved ex accessory structures. However, they were not permitted and they should have been. So there was no opportunity for the city. I understand the comment that was made about what the city did, but that means there really wasn't any opportunity for the city mm -hmm. to determine that they were gonna be a, uh, within the approved setback and that they should have been moved. So I think the code enforcement action would be the first occurrence of the city knowing that is what it sounds like to me. Uh, True. So, okay, that's all, all right. I've got to say. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Um, I just want to clarify, Mr. Dodd. Uh, Mr. Harris did say that his large shed was approved by the building department, and the smaller sheds were there at the time, and they were in the spot where they are now. So, no. So, uh, yeah, they did know that well, they were I, not I, in the setback. I, 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 I have to go by. I mean, that's, that's kind of like if I was truly a judge and we were in a court, I'd have to call 22 witnesses to prove that that was done. And, and you know, I, I know what he said, and I don't question his his honesty, but I don't have any anything that tells me that that was done. I mean, well, in that case, we should have the officer come up and say he did that. Um, I have to assume that the city staff, I, and I understand how dangerous of a statement this is because I've had experience too, but I have to assume that the city staff is not gonna walk by a required permitted shed and say you don't require a permit. And if they do, that's, a, that's not a city issue, that's a personal issue with that individual. So for me to, I, I don't, and I'm not impugning your integrity at all, sir, but um, I, I can't accept the fact that he said that as proof that it was actually, that a city staff member did that, so. Anything else? Okay, well, I have the transcript from the code enforcement hearing and it was stated in there by Curtis Bloomfield that that happened and right. by the inspector. Okay, anything else? No. Mr. McParlin? No, I think it's all been said. All right, thank you. I think, you know, when we're, when we're looking at this, again, a lot of the stuff that has been stated uh, is irrelevant. If you, if you look at the overheads, the lot that's directly adjacent to these are gonna ultimately be built, and if there's a house there with windows and pool, a pool, then they're gonna be looking at the back of these. So rel whether or not the, it's a vacant lot today, I think does, does, should not come into to our decision as to whether or not we allow this variance, because if we allow this variance, that will go on forever, even after that lot is developed. And I think that it's incumbent upon us, as the Board of Adjustments, to go through the checklist and determine whether or not this even qualifies for the variance. Does it have an, exist, uh, an existence of special circumstances or conditions? It does not. Uh, was the condition created by the applicant? No. Uh, wait, I'm sorry. All right, is the hardship exist? The fact is no, it does not. Uh, is it a minimum variance? That's something we don't really know, again. So we, I, I don't know that this board, uh, non-injurious to public welfare, no. Uh, so I'm seeing that this doesn't even come close to meeting the requirements for this uh, board to provide a variance. Uh, therefore, I will make a motion for denial. Second. Roll call, please. Vice Chairman Kitchen? Yes. Mr. Dodd? Yes. Mr. Iovino? No. Mr. McPartland? Yes. Chairman Hill? Yes. Okay. 
Motion carries. All right. Now I'll adjourn the Board of Adjustments meeting and re-adjourn as the City Council. That leads up to item nine. I'll give us about 30 seconds. All right, Council, that leads us up to item nine, consent agenda. To move approval of items A, B, C, and D. Second. A motion to second. Roll call, please. Council Member Dodd? Yes. Council Member Avino? Yes. Council Member McCarthy? Yes. Mayor Hill? Yes. Vice Mayor Kitchen? Yes. Motion carries, thank you. All right, thank you very much. Uh, item 10, uh, committee reports and appointments. Are there any committee reports? Anyone would like to discuss any of their committees tonight? I'm sorry. Committee reports? Oh, no. All right, hearing none, we'll move to uh, item 11, public hearing. Uh, we have no public hearings this evening, so we will move on now to unfinished business. Item 12A, consider and discuss 2018-2019 budget objectives. Uh, Mr. Dodd, you brought this up as something you'd like to talk about, so I will go ahead and give the floor okay. to you. Uh, first, let me apologize. I think I turned on my confusion switch when I typed the stuff that I sent to Joe, because after rereading that, it was kind of confusing to myself, mm. and I typed it. So but what it boils down to is that um, I feel like that the council needs to uh, uh, prior to the preparation of the budget needs to provide uh, any guidance that we may have for prioritization or for um, uh, consideration by the staff and by the budget committee. Um, and so my, the, the, the gist of the information that I sent Joe that included in the packet was that um, I'd like for, uh, to get the council to agree uh, that we should instruct the staff and the budget control budget review committee to concentrate on staff on uh, capital improvement plan information for the um, additional five to add an additional five hundred thousand dollars to the street millage and repaving and swale improvement section. That's beyond the money that's in the existing capital improvement plan for 2019 uh, from from the last year's budget. Um, I think in the process of trying to identify funds that they can free up for that, that it would be possible for them to look at uh, working waterfront phase three. There's an item in there tonight that we're going to look at on that project. I don't know if that's the completion of it, but we had some money in there that may end up being more than we need. And if we do, that might be freeable. If not, then it can be de dealt with. And also the public works garage movement. Um, we we made an it did an impact on that actual project at our last meeting and it may well change the the um, the time frame on that and there's liable right now there's two million dollars in next year's budget to do that it might be appropriate to pull some of that money out and slide it into the street paving um, and swale removal uh, secondly the other item is that we've spent a, a a lot of effort the city manager to his credit has spent a lot of effort in revamping our our um, vehicles, transportation, uh, trucks for the for the street department and so forth. Mm -hmm. I think it's time for us to <clears throat> concentrate on staffing a little bit in that area. Um, and I'd like for us to provide direction to them that they, uh, they look at additional staff as needed to improve their ability to do street repair and swale production. Um, and I'm not talking about management staff, I'm talking about working level staff. Um, yeah. So I think if we don't say something about that, it's going to be it, it, it would be very difficult for the city manager to come back and say I want to add people if he hasn't hasn't been given some direction that we agree that that's a possible mm -hmm. priority for him to do. So I think that if the council agrees to do that, um, it'll provide him a little bit of a relief and some uh, some direction towards um, looking at additional <coughs> staff. Um, I'm I'm thinking that we might talk about certainly being willing to accept the uh, current millage rate uh, and try to see about going to rollback instead of mandating or trying to mandate a rollback rate for this coming budget cycle. Um, but I don't know that that's necessary. That would be up to the city staff to decide as they go through the budget process. So I would propose uh, if it's acceptable um, that we uh, instruct the city manager to 
to add five hundred thousand dollars to the street millage repaving and swale improvement uh, capital improvement plan for the uh, 2018-19 budget cycle and to review uh, the uh, applicability of adding staff people in the stormwater and um, and public works department right public works yeah public works department well you know I, I do have a couple of comments to that I think that uh, I'll first state that I think we should always have a goal of not raising taxes unless we have to. But I also think that we should always have a goal of providing the, the necessary services or the services that we've been providing and the services that the citizens of this community require. I don't believe this city manager and I don't believe the next city manager is going to be afraid to, to ask us or let us know what that requires. See, we come up with the ideas of this is what we want and these, this is the level of service that the people want. If our parks aren't in as good a shape as the, the, as, as the people think they should be and we get a lot of complaints or we're on the parks and we don't believe they're in, in as good a shape, then we need to go to the city manager uh, either through the council or to send people to him uh, or her to have that discussion and then it's up to them to decide whether or not it requires more staff or or more money. I'm inclined to go along with, with, with more money for paving and drainage. I'm certainly inclined to do that. But when we start talking about staffing, I have never disapproved a staff increase that's been presented by the city manager. Uh, so I don't know why they would be afraid to, to think that, that they can't come to us and say, well, if this is what you want, then this is what it will take. And it's up to them to determine that, not us. Who are we to determine whether or not we need 25 guys on a road and bridge or the road crew or, or, or 10? That, that I don't think is up to us. I think that the, the, the willingness to, to, to approve or go forward with whatever is necessary, I believe uh, it, it's, it's important for him to understand or her to understand that we are willing to do what it takes uh, as long as we're being as conservative and cost effective as we can possibly be uh, because you know every single penny spent by this government belongs to the people who are outside of these doors and some of them who are here so we have to be very diligent in that and we I don't believe are the ones who are qualified to determine how many people he needs. No, but we set the priorities. Uh, mm -hmm. At least we should set the priorities. Mm -hmm. uh, and then far as budgeting cycles go on, I'm, I'm not 100% sure that the council has been doing that. Mm -hmm. We do set the priorities. And if we establish to the city manager an indication that we're willing to accept additional staffing, then that gives him uh, or gives the city manager um, an opportunity to understand that he's, he's got the support of the council to determine whether that staff can be hired and be made effective. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that the city manager wouldn't do that, uh, uh, wouldn't, wouldn't come to us and ask for that, but we do establish priorities. And I think it's, it's um, not, only, uh, not only appropriate, it's required that the elected body establish those priorities. And we don't do a planning job. Mm -hmm. I mean, we don't have a strategic plan. We don't have a tactical plan mm -hmm. that we as a city council has approved that he as a city manager is required to budget to. We don't have any of that. Uh, he's, he's budgeting based on what his tactical plan is. Mm -hmm. And then we, we wait until September and look at the numbers like we did last year and say, oh, by the way, add money to stormwater. And it's already been done at that point in time. We say bad money to stormwater, or we do these things. So, to me, the uh, I mean, just the natural standard planning process is that you develop strategic plans, tactical plans, sure. you budget, and then you execute. And we go through that. And we process. haven't we haven't actually done that. So all I'm saying is that in in regard of for these two activities, if we establish that that we're willing to accept that. Um, that he spend more money in these areas and that he look at the ability to do staffing in these areas, then he has some marching orders that he can, he can go through. And it's, a, it's right. basically a, an objective or a plan. And, and, I, and I like to have objectives and plan, and we do have a long-range plan, and we do approve. This council does approve it, and I understand where, the, where most of that yeah, comes I, from. And, and, and we have committees out there, Parks and Rec Committee. Uh, we have committees out there who, who actually do provide some of the some of the wants from the community. But I will tell you this, you know, on the, the overall budget, when you say that the guidance is to meet 2018 millage rate, then that would be guidance to raise taxes. Because the likelihood of our property values going up is very high. 
So, so I don't want to go forward and say that we, sh we should do everything we can to meet rollback. Okay. Because that's a tax increase. So what we should do is, I I'm sorry, to, to meet this current millage rate. Because the current millage rate would be a, a tax yeah. increase. So my, I would suggest that we would go forward with always the goal to only spend the last possible. Hey, I got good news tonight. The students in some of the schools in Sebastian are growing grass and mangrove trees to plant along our water's edges. That's great. The bad news is the city's still killing grass and mangroves and everything else that grows along the water's edge with glyphosate. What's the deal? The rest of the country, the world, is up in arms over this stuff. I think it's time that we table this and ask to study this. You've got some environmental people now on your staff. Let's look into this, okay? We've offered you 60 alternatives. We've got grants that can do, take care of this stuff. You need to stop listening to this. I think it's common sense. All right, thank you, sir. Anyone else from the public wish to speak this evening? Yes, sir. Good evening, Ben Hawker, City of Sebastian. First, I'd like to thank the city manager for getting back to me on a situation that I found out other people are having, and it's called a robocall. I'm getting robocalls on the phone, and when you look at the caller ID, it's stating City Sebastian. And you try and call that number back, it's a dead number. So somewhere the numbers of the city or robocalls are coming in to the people, telling them of, doesn't say anything, it's just a call that says City of Sebastian. A quick other one is I just heard of a woman that got a call of her nephew being in jail, needing $2,000. It happened here locally. This is secondhand, but it's pretty good. and elderly woman responded to the phone call. A van even came to her house and picked her up to take her to the bank. <laughs> uh, just a little awareness. Uh, since we voided the um, dispensary ordinance, I guess I can talk about it. I went down Malabar Road coming in from the airport and I see a big sign across the storefront, about the width of the council table here, and two foot high letters in green, and it says marijuana doctor, with the pot leaf and a cross in the middle of it. Curiously, I stopped. And this doctor, or this group, one, two, three, four, five. There are five places that anybody can go to, get a printout from your local pharmacy that you've taken a opioid or painkiller, go back and see them, $400, <laughs> say hello to the doctor, you mail $75 to the government, and you'll get your marijuana card which is all legal at this point. And then you get seven months worth of a prescription written by the doctor. So you only see the man once. Now you got seven months. It's called in to the dispensary in Orlando. Now you might have a problem getting there, but that's taken care of. They'll deliver it to your home. Now in there were two packets of, by the way, no insurance covers this medication within it. I understand it's needed by people, yes. But what I see here is a situation that, uh, it's a lousy print of the picture, but you've gotta visualize a storefront. It's a massive sign, and I don't know if it complies with our sign ordinance, which we got some problems with, but as a doctor, he can go right next to a school and open up. Now, in the parking lot were multiple out-of-state plates. 
I'm not citizens of Florida or residents of Florida, but I don't think that really made much difference. All I'm saying is that you might want to look into the fact that a doctor can operate where I came from in his home as an office, as a home office. So you might run into that situation. But again, it's roughly $500, get your card, your prescription to call into whatever level, as he said, there's, there's 30 or more items on the back of the card that it even just says pain, okay. and you qualify. Thank you. Again, do we want, well, we can't stop. It's a doctor's office. I don't know what our zoning changes would do, if anything. You need to wrap it up, sir. It's not dispensering product. All right. Uh, by the way, you can get the little insert in thank the you, oil sir. for your thank you, sir. e pipe. Thank Th you. Thank you very much. Anyone else from the public wish to speak under public input? Yes, ma'am. Mr. Mayor and council members, um, I'm here tonight because Could, I just wanted. Not to interrupt you, I apologize. Could you please please uh, state your Got name oh, I'm and, sorry. and where you're from? My name is Colleen DeMello, and I live on Gossamer Wingway in Sebastian. Um, and I'm here tonight because I wanted to talk about um, an issue that has been coming up in my neighborhood and in the, in the community about increased um, air traffic going on at the um, Sebastian Airport. Um, and thus it's creating some increased noise um, in our residential area in the neighborhood. <laughs> And so just to give you a little bit, I moved to Collier Club. I live there. Um, I've only been there for a little over a year. But when my husband and I decided to build there, um, and we actually faced the airport, we love it there. We love our property. And um, we actually found the airport to be one of the deciding factors very charming um, when we moved there. However, um, within the last three to six months, we've noticed a tremendous increase in the amount of air traffic and the amount of specifically the touch and go kinds of traffic that's coming in there. So not only during the day, um, but it's increasing at night. So in given any day or night, we've got um, airplanes and helicopters and they're coming in and they're touching down and they're taking off. And so I, it's not necessarily it's not the parachute school that we're uh, concerned with um, and that's always been a highlight I love to watch the parachuters but it's really I think the flight schools um, have increased the amount of traffic that they're coming in um, and it's creating you know a, a quite a noise um, in the neighborhood so I think what's most concerning uh, for me and what I've heard in the neighborhood is um, when it goes on into the late hours of the evening, it's going on up into, you know, 8, 9, 10, 11, and I've got people that's reported to me that 2 a.m. Um, that they're being woken up by helicopters, by the sounds of airplanes touching down, screeching wheels, and then accelerating and taking off again. Um, into all areas, you know, all hours. And so I just wanted to come here and make the council aware of that. And I don't know, you know, maybe that can be looked into in terms of we, we do have a concern being <coughs> residents there um, of that happening in our neighborhood. Thank you very much. Um, we actually, uh, thank you for your, for your concern. Uh, you know, I, we actually received a letter uh, relative to this from um, a Mrs. Slade, a Miss Slade. Um, and I had some conversations with Mr. Griffin, if you would like to uh, talk about those a little bit. Um, the issue of, about uh, offensive air traffic is really one of the transient flight school traffic that comes into Sebastian. The biggest, uh, the biggest uh, violator, if you will, uh, the entity that um, provides most of that negative impact is uh, flight safety of Vero Beach. It's been certainly an issue for the 12 years I've been with the city of Sebastian and the years that I was out at the, out at the airport. It affects, uh, it really affects the folks in Roseland more than it, than it does the city of Sebastian, but really I view it as a community impact, uh, on negative impact in, in what, they, um, what they impose on us. It really, it runs in, 
uh, cycles, and uh, I have to agree with the, with the speaker, there has been a huge uptick uh, in this. Uh, when, when I was the airport director, I remember going down to flight safety and trying to reason with them, developing flight procedures, uh, noise abatement pr procedures, uh, try and cajole them and negotiate with them to do the right thing. Uh, I know that uh, Scott Baker, our airport director, has done the same thing. Uh, frankly, um, the only way that I can put it is uh, they come up here and use our facility and uh, give us the corporate middle finger from time to time about if we complain to them about what goes on. I'm sorry for such a uh, crude metaphor, but it's true. That's, that's what they do. And uh, there's no reasoning with them. They will maybe change their ways or lay off Sebastian for a week or two, but then it goes right back to the old, to the old, uh, their old ways. So I really, uh, if I could wave a magic wand for the community, North Indian River County, Roseland, Sebastian, it would be to uh, um, have them never come back, but that's, uh, you know, they'll come up here in their starch white shirt with their four striped epaulets and tell you that they do so much for the community and they hire all these people and great economic impact on the, uh, on the, um, uh, for Indian River County, but, uh, after I'm gone, they come up here and they address you and their lips are moving, they're lying to you because they've lied to us many, many times. So don't fall for it. Uh, our, our hands aren't totally tied, but uh, really we have not much that we can do about it. They will argue that they pay a federal excise tax on the fuel that they purchase, and that's correct. Uh, and that gives them access, uh, unfettered access to uh, to an airport such as ours. Consider the fact that we are eight nautical miles north of Vera Beach Airport. We are the closest outlying field for them, so they can, and their objective is to get as many touch and go landings for, the, uh, for their students as they can, and then move them through the pipeline and get them back to the countries they came from. So that, that's kind of it. And, uh, Years ago, I petitioned the FAA, let them know that there is an incompatible use uh, at Sebastian Airport, especially when you consider we have a, a, um, a um, skydive operation here, and then this influx of uh, transient flight school touch and go traffic. It's an incompatible use in my view. Skydive Sebastian's been here for virtually 30 years. They, uh, they contribute to the economic sustainability of our airport, which is very important. Uh, transient flight schools and their touch and go operations contribute nothing, nothing to our airport. Uh, only the hate and discontent that you've just kind of heard here from uh, one of our citizens. So um, if council um, approves, I will get a letter together. I will send another letter to the FAA uh, talking about this inc incompatible use, and we'll see where that goes. Well, council, I would uh, ask if we have consensus to have that letter drafted and sent up to the FAA. Do it. Absolutely. No problem. Okay, thank you very much, and we appreciate you bringing that forward to us. Anyone else from the public have anything to offer this evening? Seeing none. Uh, Council, it's about 8.10. We've got uh, several items to get through, a couple maybe a little bit longer. Does anyone need a break, or shall we go forward? Good break. No break. All right, let's get this done. All right, uh, item 14, new business, 14A, award construction service agreement to Tim Rose Contracting. Mr. Griffin. Uh, yes, sir. I'm finally able to bring this forward tonight. Uh, this is a result of these two contracts, a result of a uh, publicly published bid for contract street milling and paving services. Uh, range of construction, Tim Rhodes uh, uh, contracting. Uh, we will use uh, uh, both of these services for contract milling and paving. As asphalt uh, projects come up, you're gonna see a project uh, in the next item. But certainly we can use this for uh, uh, parking lot projects, whatever the asphalt project is, we can, we can uh, uh, um, uh, contract that uh, that company through a, a, a CSA construction services agreement. So we are recommending approval of these two agreements. Thank you. Got a motion? 
I'll move approval. Second. All right, thank you. Is there anyone from the public who wishes to speak on this item? All right, seeing none, any discussion by council? Any questions? Hearing none, roll call, please. Council Member Evino? Yes. Council Member McPartland? Yes. Mayor Hill? Yes. Vice Mayor Kitchen? Yes. Council Member Dodd? Yes. Motion carries, thank you. Item 14B, authorized work authorization number one to Tim Rose contracting Mr. Griffin. We talked about uh, Keystone Drive uh, a few weeks ago. This, uh, we're bringing this uh, work authorization forward. Uh, we have chosen uh, Tim Rose Contracting based on the construction service agreement that was just approved prior to this. Uh, this is for Keystone Drive on the north side of uh, Barber Street and also on the south side. North side is about 1,000 linear feet. Uh, south side of Barber is around 800 linear feet, and we are recommending approval. All right, thank you. Motion, please. I move, uh, move approval. Second for discussion. A motion, a second. Anyone from the public wish to, to discuss this item? Seeing none, yes, Ms. Kitchen, Vice Mayor. Uh, Mr. Griffin, did you clarify those items that I asked about? Yes, I did. And uh, actually, we're getting well, two of those items uh, virtually for free. The, uh, the, ex uh, the grass issue, which uh, which is uh, 1900 and change and 1500 and change. Also, Mr. Rose is giving uh, the asphalt at $110 a ton instead of 100 and 115. Did he originally quote it? He originally quoted 115 in the earlier quote, but he's agreed to go to the general services, general services agreement bid price of 110. 110. Okay. So actually, we're going, we're going to get a better deal than the 46, so 797. He did agree to go to the bid prices. Yes, ma'am. Thank you very much. Any more questions from council? Hearing none, I had there was some. I was a little bit confused in reading through this because there was uh, um, uh, in the engineering report it stated the Keystone would be about a thirty some thousand dollar job that simply needed an overlay. Uh, discussions with the city manager uh, and, and and in the bid from uh, Tim Rose, it stated that it needed more than an overlay. There were some sections that needed to be. Uh, completely rebuilt or, or some repair of the sub base and that's why their bid came in at higher and that's why the, they're going to actually be doing the proper repairs on the road rather than just the overlay. So that's the only questions or, or, or thoughts I had on it. So I will ask for a roll call please. Council Member McPartland? Yes. Mayor Hill? Yes. Vice Mayor Kitchen? Yes. Council Member Dodd? Yes. Council Member Evino? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. All right, item 14C, first reading of ordinance number 0-1802. An ordinance of the city of Sebastian, Florida, amending, revising, and updating chapter 42 of the Code of Ordinances relating to fire prevention and protection, providing for severability, conflicts, and effective date. I move approval. Second. I got a motion to second. Uh, anyone from the public wish to speak on this item? All right, hearing none, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, I'm Wayne Esseltine, building official for the city of Sebastian. Um, I have a short PowerPoint uh, presentation here uh, uh, for this ordinance that's before you to uh, amend and revise and update Chapter 42 of the City of Sebastian Code of Ordinances uh, entitled Fire Prevention and Protection. So a little bit of background, uh, Florida Statutes 553.79 states that no building permit can be issued that is subject to review of the Florida Fire Prevention Code and Life Safety Code until it is reviewed and approved by a certified fire inspector pursuant to Florida Statute 633.216. Currently, the Indian River County Fire Bureau provides these services, and this applies to all new commercial buildings, additions, or renovations, including fire sprinkler and fire alarm permits. So the current process involves applicants for commercial projects uh, required to submit to the City of Sebastian Building Department, as well as take a separate submittal to the Indian River County Fire Bureau in Vero Beach. So the time frames for permits and inspections are routinely delayed because of two separate agencies involved in the same process. This divided process is time consuming, costly to the applicant, and adverse to the economic development of the city. So what the city would like to establish is a one-stop procedure 
when construction plans can be reviewed by the city for compliance with the Florida Building Code as well as the Florida Fire Prevention Code and Life Safety Codes. The applicants will be able to submit their plans to the building department and expect to have their plans reviewed in a timely manner. This will expedite the permit process greatly. Also, the inspections requests will be done through one agency only, only eliminating the need for a duplicate inspections with two separate agencies. So this is done through the proposed ordinance giving the authority to city council to establish a fire marshal's office <clears throat> responsible for the enforcement of the city's fire prevention and protection regulations and the laws and rules of the state fire marshal. The city fire marshal or designee will be responsible for the issuance of permits, certificates, notices, approvals, and or orders pertaining to life safety, fire control, and fire hazards. The proposed ordinance designates the building director to be the fire marshal for the city. So in conclusion, the proposed ordinance 018-02 gives authority to city council to establish a fire marshal's office for the purpose of enforcement of the laws and rules of the state fire marshal. The creation of a one-stop shop procedure at the building department will greatly enhance the city's ability to expedite the permit process and control, control all aspects of fire prevention and life safety. Finally, the establishment of the fire marshal's office within the city of Sebastian is in the best interest of the health, safety, and welfare of the citizens of Sebastian. All right, thank you. Before we go forward with questions, you may want to stay there because yes, there, there may be some questions. Council, we received an email from um, Mr. Collins, uh, and I'd like for that to be attached as public record to this agenda item, please. Any objections? Any questions for Mr. Esseltine? No. I have a question. Go ahead. If the building department's going to do it, who's certified? to be able to, to do those inspections? I'm currently um, going to be sitting for my exam. I've taken all the 200-hour requisite courses. I'll be sitting for my exam um, very soon. Um, but not only that, uh, upon second reading, uh, what we are proposing to bring before council, if, it's, if approved, is a resolution to contract with a company called SafeBuilt. Um, who does fire uh, plan review and inspections, uh, not only for the city of Felsmere, but uh, Port Orange, uh, no, I'm sorry, Orange County. Right, I'm familiar with that. And so we are um, aware that there is going to be a little bit of a learning curve and we need to have expertise in here and then we're going to utilize these people as long as we need them. <clears throat> okay, thank you. All right, thank you very much. And uh, my understanding, Mr. Griffin, is that that will not have an impact to the budget as that process is passed on to the applicant. That's correct. All right, thank yes, you sir. very much. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I've, yes, got, go I've got one small thing, and it's it's not material except that in uh, on page 201 of 253 in subsection C under 4227, uh, it indicates that the building director shall be designated as the fire marshal for the mm -hmm. city and shall have all the power. I'd like to recommend that we modify that to state that the city manager will designate the fire marshal uh, and submit that designation to the city council for approval. The reason for that is that it would provide some flexibility in the future if the city manager decides that they uh, would like to have someone other than the building director perform those services, mm -hmm. and it, it would stop us from having to modify an ordinance to do that. It would just be a matter of submitting that to the council as opposed to going through the ordinance approval process. Right, that, that makes perfect sense to me. <coughs> so uh, it, if the motion yeah. could be modified to, to do that, that would be fine. If not, I'll, I'll offer an amendment. Did you want to move? Can you give me that uh, section again? To it's uh, on page. page 201 of 253. Uh -huh. It's subsection C uh, in okay. the middle of the page. Okay. It's like the next to the last sentence in that. It says the building director shall be designated as the fire marshal for the city and shall have all the power and authority, da, da, da. What I'd like to recommend is that be modified between the first and second reading to say that the city manager shall designate the fire marshal and submit that designation to the city council for approval. That way, if in the future it's determined he'd like to change that designation, we don't have to go through an ordinance change. We can do that with just a submission at the council. Yeah, that makes that makes perfect sense. I mean, right now it's right now he's choosing for it to be the the building. The, well, the, I mean, he'll just at the, right. at, the, at the process he would just send us a, in our consent agenda right. designate Wayne as the as mm -hmm. the fire marshal, and at some point mm -hmm. in the future he might say, I want to designate this individual right. as acting fire marshal. Or something I agree. Like I that. think I think that's a good idea. Yeah, just okay. Is that all right? That's yeah. fine with me. Okay. So we have an amended yeah. motion, I, and you can I second? comment on that as well? Beg your pardon. Can I comment on that as well? Did you did you make the second? Who made the second? Oh no, I, I didn't. I, I'm sorry. Do you? Well, I made the all right. Second. Thank you very much. Yeah. Go ahead. Oh yeah. 
I just say no, I agree with it. Um, I think because it, in the interim of it, uh, when we get into the future, we may want to have somebody that actually has fire experience mm -hmm. in, in as far as inspections and things go. I mean, that plays a big part in it. I mean, I'm not devaluing what he's going through, what kind of training that he's getting, but like uh, the, the shores, we actually have a, uh, our fire marshal is actually an experienced uh, firefighter. So. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any further discussion? Thank you, Wayne. Thank you. Uh, roll call, please. Mayor Hill? Yes. Vice Mayor Kitchen? Yes. Council Member Dodd? Yes. Council Member Avino? Yes. And Council Member McPartland? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you very much. That leads us to Mr. Uh -huh. Stokes, uh, item 14D. Uh, Welcome to Sebastian. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, the issue was raised uh, at the last meeting regarding money spent on replacing and upgrading the field lighting at the Barber Field Sports Complex uh, and whether it was a proper use of recreation impact fees. Um, I did do the research on this. Section uh, 74.55 of our City Code of Ordinances specifically and expressly permits recreational impact fees to be utilized for, among other things, improvements uh, to recreational facilities. Specifically, the language says that monies collected may only be used to acquire, construct, or provide improvements to, uh, to the facilities. Uh, the limitations set forth in the code uh, the one limitation is that monies collected in a designated rec recreation zone cannot be used in another zone for a neighborhood park, uh, but that restriction doesn't apply to community parks. And if you look at our uh, comprehensive plan, the uh, recreation and open space element defines uh, what is a neighborhood park, defines what is a community park, and then goes on in tables to list what currently exists as neighborhood parks and community parks. Uh, Barber Field is a community park, um, and by definition, community parks uh, are the athletic fields. Uh, so, so based upon what's in our code and what's in our comp plan, uh, it is an allowable expenditure of recreation impact fees to be spent on improvements to, uh, to the ball field lighting there. So. All right, thank you very much for that. That's the second city attorney that said that we're doing it right, and this one happens to be certified in municipal law. Anyone from the public wish to speak on this item? Seeing none. Nope. Wait, wait, wait. Ooh, a little slow there, sir. Come on. <laughs> Welcome, Mr. Attorney. Welcome to Sebastian. <laughs> Damian Gilliams. With all due respect, Mr. Mayor, I don't consider that an improvement. He may consider that improvement. Now, I know a lot of lawyers that can call something gray, something black, and something white. But when it's gray, you can, you can move things back and forth and, and decide in your mind that that's an improvement. But as far as I'm concerned, that's not an improvement because it's existing. An improvement is something that is new, something that is brought to the table that I respectfully disagree, and he may be Sir. the attorney, Direct your comments to I'm me talking and to me you. only. Sir, when I'm speaking, do not speak. I would ask that you direct your comments to me only. Thank you, you may proceed. When you have an existing light that is failing and your fixture is dilapidated and it's broken, that is a repair. That is a replacement. That is not allowed under our existing code. And I respectfully disagree now, if there was no lighting there, there was no existing unit there, and you took the money and utilized the recreation impact money to put something new there, that would be an improvement. So, yeah, I can get an attorney here, and he'll probably say something different too. So, uh, and since we're on the subject of zones, You've been moving money around, and I see that you possibly may change the code in the future. The money that you collect for those zones need to stay in those zones and stop taking them and moving them around like a little shell game so that the, those zones get the proper recreation that were required when that developer and when the units were, the money was collected. Okay, so welcome to the city, Mr. City Attorney. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Anyone else from the public wish to speak on this? All right, so um, 
I appreciate that. Uh, we have two city manager, uh, city attorneys that have stated that we're doing it legally. Um, and I would suggest that it was great that the city manager also explained the idea of being able to use funds uh, for regional uh, or parks, which is also in the ordinance. Leads us to item 14E, first reading of ordinance number 0-18-03. An Mr. ordinance to the city of Sebastian, Florida, providing for the voluntary annexation for land consisting of 182.87 acres, more or less, located south of vacant industrial zone land west of the FEC Railroad and Old Dixie Highway, and north and east of Sebastian Highlands and South Moon under residential subdivisions, providing for the extension of the corporate limits and boundaries thereof, providing for interim land use and zoning classification, providing for conflict and severability, and providing for an effective date. All right, thank you. Mr. Griffin? Um, Ms. Frazier, our Community Development Director, will be making the presentation, sir. Thank you. Good evening. Um, the uh, petition for a voluntary annexation was made uh, for this property, which is an enclave within the city. So in accordance with Florida Statutes 171 and the City of Sebastian's Comp Plan, we have presented Ordinance 0-18-03 for your consideration this evening. <clears throat> if Council wishes to proceed with the annexation, then staff will um, initiate public notice and a second hearing for final adoption will be set. All right, thank you. Uh, Council, do I have a motion? I'm going to move approval of Ordinance 0803. Second. I have a motion and a second. Thank you. Does anyone from the public wish to speak on this issue? Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Damian Gilliams. I, um, I'm concerned that we're going to go ahead and annex 182 acres into our community. After reading the report from Carter and Associates Consulting Engineers and Land Surveyors, and I'm familiar with that property down there because my family owned property as well in that area. I'm concerned that first of all, the city does not have a certified engineer on staff, and we do not have anybody advocating for the public and the community to make sure that when you do annex this in, the impact that you're going to create in that area where there is no train crossings except for the one to the south of the property, where is this traffic going to exit? You have 182 acres. You're talking about an already uh, a residential zoning of, um, of six, six units per acre. They're talking about maybe 3.7 after the development is done. You have South Moon Under, which is right there. That are, They were here this evening. When they find out that they're going to have 700 new homes and duplexes going in their backyard, forget about the sheds. I mean... This is going to be a major impact, major impact. And there's a lot of discussion that needs to be done here. This needs to be tabled. We need to have a city attorney, somebody who's certified, who can address the issues and the impact that this is going to bring to our community. I mean, just a few things. And I see that in the consulting engineer's report, he's talking about transportation impact. That'll come later. He's talking about the utilities, which I'm sure they have, water and sewer. He's talking about... Uh, Let's see here. Talked about the transportation, the daily trips, over 7,000 daily trips. Where is this going? Into the Sebastian Highlands on the roads that we cannot maintain as of today and the drainage that we're having problems with? Where is this traffic going? Is it going on Old Dixie Highway? Do we know anything about the presentation tonight? Was that presented to this board? Historically, there's nothing in this report about maybe there's something buried on that property. I see that they're going to do an environmental assessment. This is good. But this is major. And this is going to, um, you know, if they're going to start talking about connecting roads to the Sebastian Highlands and start traveling 7,000 daily trips into the Sebastian Highlands on roads that we cannot maintain today. And I looked at the numbers and the calculations based on 
the assessments of the, the, the appraised value of these properties. We're not talking a lot of money here based on what they're gonna bring into the community on, on, on our millage rate to justify an impact to this community. And I know how council's looking at this. Well, it's, it's an unincorporated area. It's, it, it, it'll, it'll size up the city borders real nice. But tonight you're committing to an annexation with some zoning. And now's the chance to start talking about maybe we need to reduce the zoning to increase the assessed homes that are gonna go on that property. And if you increase the assessed homes and the value that goes on that property, then maybe you'll get a little more money because we're gonna need it for protection and services for the police department and the list goes on. This is not something you just take very lightly. There's going to be impact with turning lanes. There's gonna be impact to our schools. This is not something you just, in the middle of the night, and by the way, I hope before you vote on this, whoever received money from the developers that are involved, please disclose it so the community knows who's getting money. I don't know who is and who's not. I'm just saying, for the record, let us all know who took a donation, just so that we get it all out in the sunshine. Mr. Mayor, this is not something to consider very seconds. lightly. I'm sorry? You have 30 seconds. Thank you, sir. Is there anyone else from the public that wishes to speak on this? Yes, sir. Ben Hawker, City of Sebastian. We annexed another piece of property along that roadway the, on Old Dixie. It was owned by the county. It was listed as commercial. The gentleman came before we annexed the program, the product, the building in, or not the building, but the property, and we changed the zoning because it now would go from commercial to regular use. Everything was great. Man came in. A little garage building up on the property, stuck in a couple fruit plants, called it agriculture. We're not benefiting one dime in taxes on that property. Yeah, don't look that way. It's there. Take a ride down. <laughs> now you got a piece of property that's all commercial. It's in the county. They don't want to change it to residential. That's why they're coming here. Stick a couple more palm trees up there like we got along, you know, what's the boat that bank is on? Uh, Fleming? Fleming. Yeah, right in the middle of our town. We got agricultural property. Right along the river, we got agricultural property. $400 a year for a piece of waterfront property. All right, that's the tax structure. Make it agriculture. It, I believe part of it is now and how close to where the old cement factory was going to go in that we had a big lawsuit through the county. Again, I don't see the viability of it. It's going to be a situation, as the gentleman before said, yeah, one railroad crossing, Old Dixie Highway. It goes to a restaurant and one. How do you get there? How do you go in and out? I didn't see anything on the backside of that property looking at the chart or the map or the, the uh, plot. Uh, maybe you get rid of that little trailer park that's there, put a big four lane through it. Thank you. It Thank doesn't you, sir. seem profitable. Thank you. Is there Thank anyone you. else from the public who wishes to speak on this item? Yes, sir. Good evening, Chuck Mecklane, 5070 North Highway A1A, and I have the privilege of being a team member of the ownership group that's representing this annexation. Um, I believe our application speaks for itself. I believe that adding any tax base to the city would be an asset. And yes, this land could and if could be developed within the county without an issue as well. The reality of it is, is it sits as almost an infill project 
within the geographic boundaries of the city and it makes all the practical sense to have it be annexed in. Services are there and as far as traffic or any other studies, they'll have to be submitted and they'll have to be reviewed by an engineer. So before this even goes to any sort of development stage, which certainly is a lengthy process, we will have all those answers for the review of the council and the staff uh, in this annexation request. And we would like to move this forward. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else this evening? All right, seeing none. Council, I would, I would suggest to you that this is exactly what our comprehensive plan, plan calls for. Uh, it's an infill project for sure. Sebastian to the north, Sebastian to the west, Sebastian to the south. Uh, it, it's a project that will ultimately someday be developed and you know, if Sebastian can be the one who controls that type of development, then I think that we should, especially when there's the potential for the community, which will be a less expensive community for us because of the stormwater retention that they have to, to, to have and, and the, the underwater utilities, the underground utilities that are gonna be in place. That community could potentially generate over $3 million in taxes. That's, that's substantial. Uh, if they're not in Sebastian, if they're not in Sebastian, then, I'm sorry, that's $3 million in value, so 600 and some thousand in taxes. Maybe. But if they're not in Sebastian, we don't get any of that money. Yet, they, yet the, the community still impacts our community. So I think this is exactly what we're looking for. You know, is when, when anyone starts talking at this point about traffic and environmental, those scare tactics that some like to use in this community, those all have to be done at a later date. We all know that, uh, but some people just like to scare the public uh, into thinking that we don't know what we're doing. So anything, uh, council questions, Mr. Dodd? Well, I, I, a statement, I, I, I agree with what you said. Um, the, the, and I actually agree with the speaker, uh, the first speaker about the concerns because we do have concerns about traffic. We do have concerns about a lot of things. They're legitimate. But the way this process works is that uh, without an assurance of annexation, I doubt if the development group's gonna spend the money it takes to do proper PUD planning and proper site planning and so forth because they're, uh, you know, they're, they're business people. They're not gonna spend money uh, to plan something if they don't really think there's a good opportunity for it to happen. So during the PUD process, the council's gonna have every opportunity to review the, the preliminary plat, to, lo to look at the ingress and egress roads and to look at all the utility stuff. So we're gonna have ample opportunity to deal with that as well as during the site plan process. So I'm 100% I'm in favor of this. I think Sebastian needs to grow and I don't think residential is a bad thing. I, I don't necessarily believe that we're gonna be the mecca of commercial development uh, and residential development is a good thing for us. The, the potential revenue here is, is worth it. So I'm in favor of it. All right, thank you very much. Um, there, there, I will correct myself. I did say $3 million in taxes. That's, that was incorrect. I meant $3 million in value and the taxes that will be assumed potentially would be approximately $300,000. So just to, just to be clear, on a, on a community that essentially takes care of itself. Uh, Madam Vice Mayor, anything? Um, I just wanna comment about the email that we got accusing us all of talking about this in advance and pre-approving it. I, for one, have not spoken to any of you, that's for sure. Well, that's for sure. <laughs> and would you like that to be attached uh, as record to this item? We'll go ahead and do that. All right, Councilmember McPartland. No, I'm ready. All right, hearing nothing further, we have a motion and a second. Roll call, please. Vice Mayor Kitchen. Yes. Councilmember Dodd. Yes. Councilmember Evino. Yes. Councilmember McPartland. Yes. Mayor Hill. Yes. Motion carries. Thank All you. right, thank you very much. Leads us up to item 15, City Attorney Matters. Mr. Stokes. Um, just one item. Um, at the last meeting, uh, council authorized the purchase of the uh, Sullivan property uh, along the water end. That process is moving forward. Uh, the issues come up as to who is going to be uh, uh, signing all the documents uh, at the closing. Uh, it could either be the mayor or the city manager. Our charter does call that you can authorize the manager to, to sign contracts, routine contracts, you do that every day, being uh, such a 
uh, large ticket uh, residential item. Uh, the manager and I spoke and thought we would uh, kick it back to you guys to decide if you would like the mayor to close uh, this transaction or if you'd like to authorize the manager to do it on your behalf. I'm certainly comfortable with the city manager handling that task. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. All right. Okay. Just wanted to clarify that. Thank you very much. Thank That's you. All. Mr. Griffin. Nothing tonight, sir. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Ms. Williams. All right. Councilmember Ivinio. Negative. McParlin. No, sir. Thank you. I have nothing further. Vice Mayor Kinchin. I have nothing. And Councilmember Dodd. Okay, I don't want to extend this meeting too long because <laughs> people want to get to their Valentine's Day celebrations, but um, I do have an item. On, on our, at our last meeting on, on January 24th, we had a presentation by DMC Engineering about the contract where they were working on the, uh, the canal approach. Um, I, for one, and I'm, I'm assuming other people, I was dismayed and not overly satisfied with the content of the presentation and with the direction that they were moving on that contract. Um, uh, what I would like to do is, if the council will agree, uh, is to, uh, for us to direct the city manager to cancel the contract with DMC, uh, to negotiate an uh, exit strategy from that contract. The best thing you can do sometimes is to realize you made a mistake and back out of it as opposed to letting it continue. Uh, I'd like to further uh, ask the con uh, us to direct the city manager to contact, uh, well, Tanner, who did the 2015 study. Uh, was a very comprehensive, very good study on what to do with that canal process and to discuss with them the possibility of them taking over the process of trying to put together something to get the permits put together and so forth on that. Um, I think it's important that we realize that in that 2015 study, which I think was uh, a very good engineering job, uh, they indicated in, in 2015 that approximately 8 percent of that wall system uh, was going to need to have remedial work done on it in zero to four years, which basically means we're now one year away from mm -hmm. that on about 8 percent of the walls. And an additional 38 percent were going to be have to be dealt with in four to ten years, which means we're now in a window of one to six years on those. So um, I think forgetting all about the financial concepts, because first you have to come up with a definition of how you can solve a problem before you decide how you do it financially. Sure. If, if we can agree that the city manager can take those steps, uh, this doesn't require a motion, it's just a direction of the city manager to take an action. Uh, I don't believe it requires a motion. The city attorney can comment on that uh, if we do that, but I'd kind of like to recommend that we do that. I don't think we need to let uh, DMC Engineering continue any work on that project. They're just not it's not satisfactory to me what they're doing. All right, first, I, I would like to get the city attorney's opinion on that. Yeah. Mr. Stokes? Uh, well, I, I, I do think that's action. What I, what I might suggest, though, is, you know, uh, getting out of a contract sometimes is, is, is a tricky, I mean, we have to look at it. I have to look at the contract and, and we have to, you know, <clears> see, <throat> see what opportunities would be there or what grounds would be there for, for us to be able to exit out of that. Um, I personally don't have any knowledge of that contract. So, I mean, at this point, you could direct direct me to get with the manager, look at this, and okay. come back with a recommendation at the next meeting. And that's at actually, that point, we would probably uh, ask for, for a motion and a vote to direct us to do that. That's, if, yeah, that's you know, actually what I was recommending we do, is we mm -hmm. just ask that they take the action, and they will have to bring it back to us. But sure. yeah, yeah. at the same time, then the city manager can talk to Walt Tanner about the possibility of them doing some work. I, I, we need to deal with that, and we need to deal with a, a long-term, short-term solution with that, and I think they would be much better qualified to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think we can walk away from that anymore. I think we really need to deal with that. That's a potential long-term issue for the city to deal with, sure. and, and so their original 2015 study was a very well-written document, and mm -hmm. I think that it would be appropriate for us to maybe try to go with them. It did, it did appear as though we were drifting. Uh, in his presentation, there, were, there wasn't a lot of concise uh, direction, uh, <laughs> and, and it did appear as though we were drifting. I would, however, ask the, the city manager uh, your thoughts on this. You are the one that's, that's in, in charge of this operation. Um, do you feel, as a city manager, that, that this is a step that we should take going forward? Um, I was underwhelmed at that presentation. Uh, please remember, when we put that out to bid, that was the, they were the only respondents to that Correct. bid. And uh, when I did that interview prior to, after council approved that, um, 
I did receive a satisfactory uh, report on how they were gonna proceed. Uh, Mr. Cornelius was one of two people in that interview. So um, I think we gave them the chance, but uh, frankly, from what I, I agree with uh, the presentation at the last meeting, frankly, um, I was embarrassed and I uh, apologized to council. Mm -hmm. But um, I think what would be appropriate for me to do, um, I'll be talking with Mr. Stokes about the contract itself, but also to get in hold of DMC tomorrow and just have them stop work right now uh, on the project until we can make a final determination and I'll bring this matter forward back at the council after uh, Jim and I converse on the contract itself and my, you know, our, our exit strategy or whatever we're going to do. That, does that, Is that acceptable? Yeah. yeah. I agree with that too. Fine. All right, thank you. Thank you. Anything else? Nothing else. Thank All right, you. being no further business, we are adjourned.